So while I was writing the book Post-Capitalism, an interesting thing happened to the word sharing. The open source community and the peer-to-peer -peer community had been looking for a way to explain the fairly complicated idea of network collaborative consumption. And sharing had seemed like a good enough word uh, for it. But by the time my book came out, um, it was the, the idea of the sharing economy had become associated with companies of a very different uh, nature and with different aims, who seemed to be very rapidly grabbing space in the economy to facilitate a race to the bottom in terms of uh, the, the uh, various industries. Uh, and, and the word sharing had become negative if you were, for example, a registered tourist hotel in Barcelona or a registered cab driver in many UK cities. There have been, indeed, riots in France, raids on a corporate HQ in the Netherlands, 100,000 euro fines imposed in Berlin uh, on people using the so-called sharing economy. And in Britain, a uh, massive court case over the employment status of Uber drivers and uh, strikes by Deliveroo drivers. So these are the early phase reactions to something. Another way of dealing with this land grab, something I would in general categorize as a rent-seeking land grab by very highly capitalist company, uh, capitalized companies into the, into the collaborative economy itself, in a way, one way of thinking about these companies is that they are a way of preventing Linux or Wikipedia appearing in a space, a preemptive strike against uh, collaboration and open source. But another way of dealing with the platforms, as we call them, um, is to do what they were originally designed to do, but cooperatively. Fairmondo fair began life in Germany in 2012 as a cooperatively owned marketplace that would promote fair goods and services and responsible consumption. It is owned and run democratically uh, by its members. Felix Vett is its founder, and I'm very pleased to invite Felix up with, to talk with me today, this afternoon. <laughs> you sit down in the seat. Right, what is Fairmondo? <clears throat> yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> Fairmondo is, as you said, an online marketplace. Imagine it as an eBay or Amazon marketplace where you as private people or professional sellers can buy and sell things. At the same time, and that's maybe the more interesting part, uh, we tried to do it with a different model. We tried to make it as a cooperative owned by its users, by its employees, and all stakeholders who basically feel affected by the business. Okay, so but just describe to me, I mean, it's almost a bit weird asking people to describe an online experience. It's like, tell me what it's like inside World of Warcraft. But tell me what it's like if you go on and use this. What, is, what does a user experience typically involve? Really not so different of um, standard online shops or Amazon or eBay. Um, you'll find products, you can look for them, you get descriptions. One thing that is special is that we have filters that actually make it easy to identify fair trade products, products that are sustainably pr produced, or products that are produced by small producers who put an emphasis on quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in terms of the people who are advertising or, you know, trying, or trying to market through the platform, can you describe a typical person, a typical organization or, or business? It's quite diverse, but one um, good example is the Fairphone. I think it was yeah. mentioned already, but um, <clears throat> That's for me a futuristic product or a product for the time, um, a fair smartphone that is actually more, <clears throat> uh, well, produced in a way that the supply chain is actually taking account of and, um, mm. well, yeah, the workers are actually respected in the way they produce. Okay, so we know, we kind of got an idea of what it is. Um, why, why did you do it? What, where did you come from? What were you doing before, in other words, and what made you want to do this? Yeah, so I personally came from anti-corruption work, um, more on the political side, if you want so, and then realized that if we want to change the, corrupt, the problem of corruption, at some point we have to address the, the way how businesses work. And um, at the same time, I used a lot of eBay. So um, eBay was for me one thing to look into, and I didn't like the way it worked anymore. 
yeah, and the more I discussed, the more I thought about it. Um, well, I came up with the idea to, to create a new online marketplace owned by the users, and then discussed more and more, and other people joined in, and we ended up creating a cooperative and developing this model. Now, you've called the, the business model of, of Fermondo itself Cooperative 2.0. Can you explain what, what, because you could have done this as a, you could have easily done, achieved the, the social aim, not actually as a, a, an innovative cooperative. What, what is it you're trying to do to the cooperative model itself? Yeah, if you look at it, I mean, there are many big cooperatives out there. Um, we all know them in banking and <clears throat> retail, supermarkets and so on. And not all of them are really living up to the values that uh, we were aspiring for. So we wanted to create a model that is corruption resistant, that will, even if we grow as a company, will keep its values at the forefront. So we try to incorporate the principles of anti-corruption into the cooperative model, which is accountability, transparency, integrity. And, and in terms of the employees, what, how does they relate to the, what does that mean for their everyday existence? So, <clears throat> Since we want to have a culture of participation and internal democracy, we didn't want to sub inscribe a management model or anything into our statutes, mm. which would become too rigid. Um, so the only thing we actually put into the, the statute is that the managing board, which we are required to have by German law, um, is elected by the employee assembly. So there's some kind of well way for mm -hmm. employees to, to take influence if those who are in the role of the management um, start going crazy. <laughs> what, what do you think you've achieved? Yeah. Um, good question. So far, we managed to build a cooperative and get some um, <clears throat> traction with that. Um, we have over 2,000 members. We found um, that there's quite a lot of people who are interested in seeing this alternative happening, like bringing down Amazon basically was our original mission. Um, <laughs> and uh, we also realized that it's not that easy. Um, okay, we, we knew from the beginning that it mm. wouldn't be so easy, but um, yeah, we found a lot of obstacles. But um, we made the marketplace happening. You can use it, you can buy and sell stuff on it. And um, the one thing I think we also helped to happen is that there's a movement now mm. um, called Platform Cooperativism. Um, that really wants to look into, well, how can we do this with all of these platforms out there? And I think that's what we need. So you, I know you've been recently at a, at a global conference of the platform cooperatives. What is the latest thinking among practitioners who are trying to build these things about the now, the, 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 the near term potential of them and what's, what, what's really fighting them? I mean, are there any great, uh, apart from yourselves, you know, globally relevant uh, case studies of what's happening. Yeah, so one of the things that's happening now is really encouraging collaboration among ourselves. And I think that's what we need, like looking at others who are doing similar stuff and seeing where can we collaborate. With. We try to create some kind of consortium that helps new platform co-ops to <clears throat> get going mm -hmm. and exchange information and all that. And obviously, um, one of the crucial challenges is always for startups, financing, funding, um, mm. capital. Mm. Um, we are also struggling with that. And these markets, if you look at platforms, um, they often tend to grow to, to enormous extents and get monopoly type of positions in their markets very hard to actually compete with. Mm. Um, and very hard to create alternatives that are visible and um, usable in the very technical sense. Um, so the, developing the open source software that we developed um, nearly brought us down just because we, we spe basically spent all our money on it. Mm. <clears throat> so the typical platform cooperative is, is struggling with, I mean, it, it, is, it, it is in a declaration of war situation on these big, you know, venture capital uh, financed uh, disruptors. Um, and it's typically struggling with scale. Isn't there an argument that some of them have achieved scale because, the, first, the user experience was so great, and second, because some of the things they were disrupting were so bad, you know, in the sense of the local you know, mafia-controlled taxi firms, very highly organized and, 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 and over, um, overpriced um, local hotel situations. <laughs> 
But what do you say to that argument? Because that's their defense, ultimately. I think they're not just doing evil. I mean, they actually bring some, something useful to society. Um, they're just structured the wrong way. And I think if we want to address this, we really have to think about, okay, how can we provide actually better products? Um, mm. There are always things that you, can, that you can do better and innovate on. Mm. At the same time, you also have to see that they are pushed into the markets with a lot and a lot of capital. Mm. Um, they've been working in a small scale and then venture capital comes in mm. and, and more and more of investment banking and so on. And they, they use billions to make this so big and to actually get the market power that then creates the network effects that make them so nice for customers. Mm. I'm thinking specific, specifically of, uh, I'm almost like an expert, a user expert on, um, on uh, minicab uh, apps. Uh, not because I like minicabs. Um, but there was, an there was an interesting one, um, a more normal sort of entrepreneurial private sector one, uh, Taxi Beat, that took, that, that, that took over the well, it's trying to take over the cab system of Athens. And it had, in some senses, all the things that the users like. So women like it because you see a named driver, not some guy who has um, borrowed the license of somebody else. You can give them a mark. So it, it wasn't rocket science, even for the normal private sector, to work out that information technology can transform the user experience. Mm -hmm. Why do you think... Why did we need those big venture capital to come in and do it? Why didn't we just do it from the scratch ourselves? In other words, why didn't somebody do Fairmondo before eBay? What's gone wrong? Okay, but eBay grew also from a community-driven mm. <clears throat> kind of enterprise. And I think at the time, nobody was even considering the cooperative model mm. for digital businesses. I think that that was just not in the mind and you don't mm. learn it at business schools and nowhere, mm. not in Silicon Valley. So how should they think of mm. it? Um, no, I think we needed these experiences to see, okay, they create monopolies, they're very hard to control from the state side, um, mm. so how can we actually create the next model that is just better than, than what we see right now? And um, I think what, they, what Silicon Valley in general is doing very well is testing business models quickly and um, <coughs> technologies and, and, and scaling them very quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, classical businesses have hard time competing with that. And what is the, from your point of view, from, from Fairmondo itself, wh how, what is the scaling strategy? Well, the original one was certainly to say, <clears throat> it's very hard to do it on, on the classical business way. Um, even uh, much more resourced um, um, businesses tried it. Mm. So we thought, okay, we combine the dynamics from social movements with business. And mm. And that's how we managed to create our cooperative and create a first user base. Um, and I hoped that we would get enough resources to actually provide a good product, which we're still kind of struggling with. Um, but yeah, it's going step by step. Um, I think the next strategy is really to think about how to collaborate with the existing cooperative movement, um, mm -hmm. where there are enormous resources out there. Um, <clears throat> big cooperative banks, but also other co-ops that we all know. Um, that do have resources and potential to reach out to people mm. and to also capitalize certain ventures. So, yeah, we need to create new frameworks of doing that. I mean, for me, uh, one of the things I constantly come back to in my work on the, you know, call, whatever you want to call it, I call it post-capitalism, people can call it whatever, is, is the need to make micro-regulatory changes so that you incentivize the creation of good sharing businesses rather than destructive ones. Uh, what, is there anything concrete that you think, for example, what would, in the German situation or even here, begin to factor finance towards your uh, organization rather than the constant flow of finance into the, the, the more destructive forms of the model? So, uh, Fremondo in particular, we really tried to just rely on members. We wanted to have this experiment of mm. having a, co -op, um, a marketplace only owned by users and really having no big investors in there. Mm. Um, that's one approach, and um, we have a difficulty from the regulatory side that in Germany you need hand sign applications to actually become a member, so we can't have pure online applications. We would have so many more members. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really, a, they have to send us a letter, um, you know, and people are not used to that anymore. <laughs> um, and 
<clears throat> then the that's the real thing. And mm. another point is, um, if you look at um, how the business uh, support structure is working, um, for many for many grants out there, or for many um, um, credits that you can get. For <clears throat> you need to have uh, a certain business structure and cooperatives are not in there. Yeah. So we re really have a competitive disadvantage, yeah. no equal market if you want so. So this is something that we find in the UK, for example, when we see credit unions, which are a fairly old form of cooperative finance, and you know, uh, getting them to the situation where they are uh, encouraged via regulation. Also ethical banking um, is something that we, we just, that our regulatory system has, has kind of, not encouraged. Um, what is the one big change you would make um, if you could? I mean, under European law, we're still in Europe. And what, is there any, is there one big thing you would want to change? Well, first of all, make that even level um, playing field. Then, obviously, I think we need proper cartel laws to actually mm. um, <clears throat> bring down those actors who took market positions that are very hard to challenge. If you mm. look at Amazon, who, who own 25% of the whole e-commerce market in Germany, like of, throughout all categories of products, mm. um, that's, that's not, uh, <clears throat> even with like classical thinking market policies, that's not aligned mm. anymore. Oh, and, I mean, why didn't, why didn't the European regulators step in and say, you know, since there has to be four banks, you know, only every high street in Britain, what, or three or four energy companies. Why? Why must there only be one eBay or one Facebook? What? what why? Why? What? Did they just not realize this was happening? I think there are many reasons. Um, the internet is complicated to regulate. Um, they're incorporated in multiple countries. They have complicated, intransparent internal structures to get around this. Um, there's so many issues. I mean, then you could also ask why? Why aren't they paying taxes? Um, mm. There's. Yeah, um, I think it's not easy. And on the other hand, they have strong lobbies. Um, it's hard to oversee them. Mm. Yeah, well, and I personally don't really believe that our policymakers are in the position um, to to understand how how these um, the next steps of them work. You know, mm. like because if you regulate what they are now, um, tech companies tend tend to change very quickly and adapt to policies. So. Um, I don't really believe that um, governments are going to uh, solve that for us. I mean, in, this, in the light of that, are you optimistic? Do you see any uh, sources of political and regulatory change, both in Germany, here, Europe in general? D can you see, if it's going to happen, what will drive it? Um, yeah, I, I'm certainly optimistic. Um, I think it will be, and there are things happening, like we are talking also to um, policymakers in, in Germany and others are. Mm. Um, they do ask us, they're curious, and um, I think, for example, this thing with the hand sign application will soon vanish, hopefully. Um, but I think it will be, after all, the major le legislation will be second step. First, we need pioneers um, of alternative business of platform mm. co-ops that actually are successful and show that it works differently and that it can work differently. And then we can lobby if you want so to actually make get a, the right policies. So given you, your need for scale and your need for reach, why did you do, why did, when, it went, when it came to the UK, why did you do it as a, almost a franchise thing rather than a, just extend your own business? Well, it's about the whole idea. The whole idea is not to create another multinational, multinational corporation. The idea is rather to create a multinational cooperative. And um, it's not even franchised. There's a completely autonomous uh, from on the UK cooperative that um, has been founded by people from the UK. And, um, and they actually then decided to cooperate with us. Um, so mm. we got an agreement. And um, it's really great that we have that, that we have this example of two cooperatives working together, creating their own um, t marketplace platform. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that will then be accessible to, to people in multiple countries. And there are people from other countries now getting interested, from Ireland, but also around the world. Um, and I think if we manage to create this multinational cooperative owned by the users and employees in each country, at the same time cooperati cooperating intensely, we have a very good chance to actually um, get them from below. What do you think, finally, uh, are the chances of the 
co the real cooperative, the real sharing, the real horizontal and networked economy. What, what do you see in five, ten years' time? Are you hopeful? I'm very hopeful. Um, five, ten years is, uh, well, I don't think, I think we have to rather think about, well, up to even 20, 30 years. Mm. But um, in five, ten years, we can definitely see models um, getting such an, um, well, get such a presence that actually people start thinking about it and um, more people join in. So we can create that momentum. Um, and there's obviously the need. I mean, um, you wrote about climate change, about changing demographics. Um, we need alternative ways to structure our economy and um, more and more people are gonna feel it. Um, we already see the political side uh, going crazy and I think uh, we need these very specific answers that show us, okay, it, it can work differently. It's actually nice if it works differently. Um, it's much more fun. It's great to work with Pamondo or others. Um, we had great talks in this morning to encourage us to, to understand how actually beautiful it can be to have a, an economy that's owned by the people and made for the people. So yeah, I'm very optimistic. Well, me too. So brilliant, <laughs> thank you. Felix, thank you. <laughs>